Welcome back. Today I wanted to talk about the way that we treat ourselves, especially when we're trying to create change or we're trying to put ourselves on a certain track, let's say meditation and yoga, when we're trying to change our lives and align with that particular goal that we have in mind for ourselves, how do we treat ourselves? Should we be strictly authoritarian? Should we quit cold turkey? Should we just force ourselves into line and be very authoritarian? Or should we be a little bit more to the middle and accommodating with ourselves and understanding with ourselves and gentle with ourselves? What is the right way? Where do we fit in that? How do we figure that out? And why wouldn't we just do what we need to do? Let's get into it. This is a principle which is really near and dear to my heart. And I get on the phone with young men especially who are wrestling with this idea. Should I just be very authoritarian with myself? And that's usually how they, they think that's the correct way to go. And then I tell them to be kind to themselves and I tell them to be accommodating to themselves. And it's, oh my goodness, really? I should be nice to myself? Why would I be nice to myself? I'm trying to get over my ego. Why would I be nice to myself? Well, authoritarianism has blowback. So whenever you go somewhere else and you do something manipulative, right, you will encounter what they call blowback. So blowback is a, a wonderful principle to marry to authoritarianism. Whenever you ride over somebody and you treat them like a doormat or you treat yourself like a doormat, you will have blowback. You will have unintended consequences that will come back to you. So you might get your way in the beginning, but there will always be a return. <laughs> Call it karma if you like, but there will always be a return of resentful actions against that authoritarianism every single time without fail. <laughs> And so the person who is very authoritative with themselves is, I will do this. Look at that. Look at that. You're very rigid. You're very controlling. And it's actually very brittle. It's a very brittle kind of strength. And it's kind of interesting. Um, if you've ever studied martial arts and you love samurai swords, the beauty of the samurai sword is it that it's at once it is very sharp and it is very pliable. So if you say, I want the sharpest sword in the world, well, you'll have to temper the steel in such a way that the steel itself becomes very brittle. It will be very, very sharp. It will be very effective for one or two cuts and then the whole thing will shatter in your face because the metal becomes brittle. It has to have this equilibrium between being sharp and being pliable, because as you use it, it will break if it's only sharp. Isn't that amazing? That the very principles of the things that we use around us have the potential to hold this kind of understanding between being sharp and effective and being flexible and pliable. It's the same thing in ourselves. We can force ourselves into a line and it's good to be in alignment, but there's a better way to get there. The way to get there is by, first of all, going inside of ourselves, getting agreement, washing out the negative things inside of ourselves, using timeline therapy, using Om Japa and the chakras. How many times have you heard that? Using heart rate variability resonance. Instead of, instead of sitting in this chair for 40 years, I'm going to use heart rate variability resonance. And I'm going to put the breath and the heart into equilibrium and they're going to move together, right? 
So I'm not going to force myself into line. I'm going to use science and understanding and technology to put my body in the correct place. And now it just kind of springs forth from inside of me that I want to meditate. I want to align my life. Maybe I have a negative emotion or a limiting decision. I use timeline therapy. I go inside. I wash it out. Maybe I use Om Japa. I wash it out. Maybe I use Huna and I wash it out. And now I feel free and I don't have to force myself into line. I've now gone inside and changed myself and now I've become in line. So it's a much better way to approach ourselves. Very similar to the way that you would raise a child. If you're too strong and too authoritative and you yell at your kid and you spank your kid over and over again and that's all that you do well then of course the child will grow up and resent you and so you will grow up and in your later life you will have consequences you will have blowback it's the same thing with ourselves if we don't understand ourselves if we don't give ourselves compassion if we don't give ourselves understanding and we're only authoritative with ourselves then we will go through our life and the subconscious mind will resent you because you don't have any agreement. You're just trying to force yourself into line. And so all of the negative things that you're trying to correct will leak out in, in very strange and peculiar ways. And uh, I remember Judy Jolly came into the ashram where I was at and she looked around at the monastics and says, you, you're all leaking. So like, what? What are you what are you talking about? She said, You're all leaking. You're all leaking. You're forcing yourself to be proper, and yet you're not doing the internal cleaning. And those negative that negative content inside of you is leaking out. And it's apparent. We can see it. As psychologists, we can see it. You are leaking. It was a very interesting thing to hear and to say. So if we can treat ourselves like a beloved child, you know, maybe you've got the new training, you go down the hallway and you go into your inner child room, realize that is the basis of everybody's psychology. The psychology that they created when they were three or five or seven or nine. Those formative years form the basis of our psychology and it's basically who you are for the rest of your life. So you grow up, you want toys, and then you grow up and you get bigger and you want bigger toys, right? <laughs> and it's, it's all the same. It's all the same. And so understanding that and working with yourself helps you to see that I, I got to be gentle and kind and loving and, and love myself as I'm going through all of this process. Be understanding, be accommodative, be gentle, be patient with yourself. And it's not easy because these are wonderful divine qualities that, that we want to enculture into ourselves, right? Being patient, being kind, being generous, being compassionate. And we, we want to just be that. But it's a formative process, right? It's bit by bit by bit by bit. We got to build on ourselves. And, so, and we will get impatient with ourselves. We, we will get frustrated with ourselves. We will have setbacks. I, I remember my guru, Ashokji, was a brilliant, he was an engineer. He had a brilliant mind. He saw Kriya as very practical. And he would sometimes get very excited as he was explaining something. He'd start yelling at me. <laughs> And I, I'd already been through, you know, uh, mar years of martial arts getting yelled at. I'm like, oh, this is nothing. <laughs> Bring it on. <laughs> and and so it didn't really phase me. And, and I could see the humor in it. And but he could be he, he wanted to make sure you were doing everything correctly. And he would sometimes yell at me as he was correcting me to make sure I got the point and really drive it home. And it, it makes for some fantastic stories I'll never forget. So it did. It worked. It drove it home for me. So it was really surprising one day when he told me out of almost nowhere, he said, it doesn't matter how many times you fall. 
it matters how many times you get back up. And I thought, how brilliant and compassionate. That is beautiful. And if you've probably heard that before, right? It, fall down seven times, get up eight, right? Beautiful, right? And, and that's us. That is the spiritual path. That is the meditative path. You know, maybe you get busy. Maybe, maybe you can do five minutes of meditation. That's the spiritual survival. Go watch the spiritual survival video. It's one of the best things I've ever done. That spiritual survival principle is huge, huge. You want that backdrop that you can fall down onto and not lose yourself, not feel as if you have lost yourself. But even if you do, even if you do lose your practice, it, which, is, which is not good. We, we want to keep our, our momentum going. And so there's, there's a kind of, you know, we're, we're culturing something inside of us that's growing, right? So we want to keep that going, even if it's just five minutes a day. But let's say we do fall. Who cares? Whatever. Ah, so I start over. It doesn't matter. Forest makes it so easy. Who cares? I can come back. Fall down seven times. Get up eight. That's you. That's me. That's the yogic path. Don't give up. Be like the bulldog. Clamp down your mouth on that and don't let go, right? That's that's the kind of spirit we want. So, you know, however we come with all of our foibles and all of our failings and all of our pitfalls and all of our faults, we don't care. We're just going to grab that meditation and hold on like a bulldog and learn to be gentle with ourselves, learn to be kind with ourselves. And this principle of ruling over ourselves is actually symbolized in the Sphinx. So if you look at the Sphinx, you have a king with a lion's body. And so the, the body, the lion, is the animal, right? That's what we're dealing with. Our instincts, our desires, our cravings inside of the body, be it sensual, be it food, be it security, all of those things have to do with the animalistic body. And the king, the pharaoh, is ruling over that lion. You've got the pharaoh's head, you know, keep your head, right? You've got the king's head and the lion's body. And the lion's body has become tame. It is relaxed. It is tranquil. It is sitting in a supine fashion, right? That means it's tranquil. So that's the symbology of the Sphinx. It's the raising of the mind over the body. And you could say that's what we're doing in the big bliss training. We're learning to create that roll up of consciousness back into the brain. And that's the one of the primary principles inside of Kriya Yoga, the Kriya Yoga of Lahiri Mahasaya. And it, it's what makes it so powerful is having that very, very subtle experience of the roll up of consciousness back into the brain. And so you can see a little bit of that in the Sphinx, that the Sphinx has become a king in his brain and the body is the supine lion. This picture here is so dear to me and it really, this comes from the Tarot. This is the picture of strength and it really encapsulates what I'm talking about. And this is a woman, an angel, an angelic woman, meaning that she's not normal. She's got some power to her. She's got some deep understandings to her. And look how she is opening the mouth of the lion. She's not wrenching it open with huge muscles. She's not levering it open with a crowbar. No, she's very gently opening up the lion's mouth. And the lion is in her command, in the realm of her love and understanding. And it's, it's a camaraderie, it's a relationship, and it hasn't been shattered or broken or beaten. If it was shattered or broken or beaten, that would be authoritarianism and it would have blowback and there's no way the line would ever respond in this way. Instead, this angel has created a relationship with the lion. It has tamed the lion in a kind and gentle way to direct it, not necessarily control it every single time, but to direct it correctly with love and caring and understanding. And that's true strength, to be gentle and kind and understanding with ourselves. And I just wanted to make a video because I reference this to people. I get on the phone with people and I start talking about this principle. It's really important because... 
So for example, if somebody tells me, you know, right out the gate, I'm going to meditate six hours a day. Well, I can guarantee you're going to go a month, you're going to go two months, you're going to go three, and you're going to quit. And then what's going to happen to your meditative practice? I would much rather you start with five or 10 or 15 minutes every day and you learn to love it. And that will get you coming back. That will hook you. We're kind of you know, we're meditative drug addicts. We're trying to hook you onto it. <laughs> we're trying to hook you onto meditation. And so that you love it just implicitly and you can't do without it. You go a couple days and I'm like, where's my meditation? I, I gotta have it, you know? Give me my meditation fix. I can't stand the left brain too much. It's great for getting things done, but man, I gotta have that quiet. I got to have that right brain perspective. I got to sit down and watch the glorious sunset and, and feel the glory of it and soak it into me. I got to have that, you know? Yeah, I, I got to look at a piece of art and go, oh my God, this is amazing. You can't do that if you're stressed out in the left brain. You, you can't witness anything. <laughs> you can't even notice that your wife got a haircut because you're living inside of a dream. When you live in the left brain, you're not really there. You're just living in your memory. And, and it's, so it's, it's very scientific. It's, you're living in a dream and the right brain is the answer to break us out of that and just really behold the wonder that we are sitting in. So if you've studied Buddhism, I'm sure this all sounds very familiar. It sounds like the middle way, doesn't it? So the Buddha is practicing this asceticism. He's hanging out with these guys that are fasting like crazy. They're beating themselves. They're flagellating themselves, whatever they're doing, right? They're just brutal with themselves doing tapas, trying to create realization. And he's doing this for years and it's not quite working. And he's just sitting there and the universe arranges that he sees somebody. And I think they're, it's a cleaning woman. And he realizes if she pulls the string too tight, it will snap. And if it's too loose, it won't work correctly. It will not play. If the string is too tight, it will snap. If it's too loose, it will not play. So in that moment, he realized the principle of the middle way, that you don't have to kill yourself. You don't have to beat your up. You can, you can actually live in the world, but not be of it not be so enamored of it, but you live here. So I, I just live here, but I'm not enamored of it. And that was the middle way. I remember a story from Brother Premamoy. He told Mitrananda, he said, I only play at life with my left hand. Isn't that beautiful? Meaning he's not controlling with his right hand, his hand of strength, right? He only plays at life with his left hand. So he does what he needs to do, but it comes from an easier place, a lighter place, not so deeply concerned and involved and overly involved, right? He's playing at it with his left hand. It's kind of beautiful, isn't it? And that's his way of talking about the middle way, right? And my way is to, to remind you of this card of the tarot and this picture of strength. Look at that angel. And the way that she is controlling the lion, it is gentle, it is sublime, and it comes from inside. It comes from an understanding relationship. And the more that we are understanding with our subconscious and we sit down and we talk with our subconscious and we create change from within that flows without, instead of trying to control from the outside back in. Now, sometimes we need to control ourselves, that's okay a little more towards the center, a little more towards the middle way will help us greatly in not encountering blowback in our meditation practice or in our lives. So hope that you love this. If you did, be sure to hit that bell down below so I can see all of you next time.